It is greater than all of these things. It's greater than the internet. It's greater than wireless. It transcends social, mobile, local. Those are really all manifestations of or components of getting everyone onto the same network all the time. With over a million professional members, the Internet Marketing Association is a force to be reckoned with. This is I Am A Leader, the official podcast of the world's largest association of internet marketers. Join Dominic Siriani, CMO, as he sits down with inspirational leaders, delves into the research lab, shares career opportunities from IMA partners like Microsoft, Oracle, and Adobe, and gives you the insights you need to perform at your best. Here's your host, Dominic Siriani. Hello, IMA, and welcome back to IMA Leader. My guest again this week is Victor Cho, the CEO of Evite. If you haven't listened to episode number 31, now is the time to go back and do that. Victor shares a lot about himself, his career, his work at Evite. It's great just getting to know uh, someone like Victor. So I encourage you, if you haven't yet, to go back, listen to that episode, and then come right back here. Because today, Victor is going to spend about a half hour to 45 minutes with us talking about connected business models. Victor, welcome back to the show. Such a pleasure to be here. I know we had the pleasure of talking just a few days ago, and I want to, again, thank you for that time. Thank you for your time today. And before we get into anything, just like I did in the last episode, for those who didn't take my advice, you have um, a term that you use frequently, and I think it comes up consistently in what you're going to talk about today. That term, of course, being global ubiquitous connectivity, or as you told us not to refer to it last time, guck. Could you tell us what <laughs> guck means to you? Yeah, absolutely. So we we are living in a in a fascinating time, in the in the in the grand scheme of society, which is really a it's really a pleasure to to be alive at this point in time, where for the first time in the history of humanity, pretty much everyone on the planet is connected to each other and they're on the same network and they're on the same network all the time because of our mobile devices. And that uh, that that core concept of everyone on the same network connected all the time, I refer to as as GUC, Global Ubiquitous Connectivity. Yeah, no, and it just has profound implications on pretty much everything: how we how we work, how we play. Uh, the fundamental the fundamental nature of social interaction is changing, which is probably obvious when you look at things like Facebook and LinkedIn. But uh, more importantly, the the actual fundamental nature of business changes from my perspective, and we're starting to see the earliest incarnations of that change in uh, some of the businesses today. That's exactly what I was going to comment on, is it's not just a human-to-human -human piece, but it's actually that guck, that uh, global ubiquitous connectivity is actually impacting different business models. And uh, before we get into that, before you have the chance to really go through and share some of your knowledge around that, uh, can you give us a brief update on yourself and maybe tell us a little bit about what you do as CEO of Evite? Oh, absolutely. So I am, uh, I, I want to say I'm the new CEO of Evite, but I, it will be my year mark at the end of, in the end of uh, June. So I guess I can't be con considered brand new, but no, I, I recently took the reins of Evite. Uh, Evite's a uh, Los Angeles based company. It's down in West Hollywood. Uh, I have uh, come on board to really take the uh, amazing brand and scale that Evite has. And for those of you that are not familiar with it, it's uh, uh, the world's top digital invitation service. I'll speak a little bit more about it in the presentation. But it has massive, massive scale opportunity uh, that is untapped to a large degree because it has historically been just an invitation service, but it can be so much more. So I'm uh, super excited to, uh, to have been given the opportunity to bring it to this next phase of growth. You had to do that last show. I refer to Evite the way I refer to Xerox or Kleenex or any other ubiquitous uh, company name that's out there. So if there's someone who has not received an Evite, if you're listening and you don't know what Evite is, email me at podcast at <laughs> imanetwork.org. Um, and we'll find out what rock you've been hiding under. But uh, Victor, thank you for uh, for the the umbrella, the description of what the organization does. Uh, absolutely, no, it's funny. I won't I won't name the competitors, but it is so it is such a broadly accepted term now. One of the risks and one of the battles that we fight is people use it synonymously for digital invitation. So, uh, especially in some of the younger generation, uh, it's funny they will say, you know, I'm going to invite you over this other service, and they don't realize that invite is actually a thing, and a site, and so that. 
<laughs> when you've become a verb, when you've become a noun, you know you're you're part of the culture. Um, I yes. aged myself two or three days ago. I was working with a member of my team who was in their early 20s. I'm in my mid-30s. And I said, well, I, I'll just map quest it. And they looked at me like I was insane. And honestly, I haven't used MapQuest in probably ten years, maybe a little less than that. Um, but they, when I was, uh, you know, when I was in my mid twenties or thirties, or young thirties, they were the 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 company du jour, and that became part of my vernacular. Evite is the uh, is the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. That, that is funny. That's that's a new one. I haven't heard that one. <laughs> that does that does date you. It does. It does. Like so I don't want to uh, to stand in the way. I got the chance to ask just a, a ton of great questions last time. So what I'd like to do at this point is turn things over to you, and then we'll come back together after your presentation. Um, I'll have the chance to ask you a few questions on behalf of our members. That sounds great. Thank you, Dominic. So I would love to talk to you all today about the new world of what I call connected business models. And it's a, it's a presentation really in three chunks. The first part will be more of a definition of you know, when I talk about connected business models, what do I mean? And I will provide a, a fairly simple framework for thinking about how or how I think about businesses in this new connected world and potentially how you should think about your business and your product experiences. Uh, I'll go through some real world examples. In particular, I'll, I'll touch on Amazon, uh, which is just an amazing example of a, 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 an incredibly complex business system, for lack of, be of a better term. Uh, and then I'll end it with some tangible, uh, making it real and tangible around the Evite brand. So I'll kind of deconstruct how someone like me, who's going in to run a company, takes a framework and actually makes it practical. Because there's there are just so many frameworks in the world that are just abstractions, and you look at it, you're like, ah, that's interesting. Uh, this one, at least from uh, from my perspective, is is quite practical because you can make real world decisions on it in terms of your strategy and product offerings. So with that, I'd love to uh, first start just with just some quick background on myself. Um, I'm a tech guy by heart. I have been with the internet since it formed in the year, well, not since it was originally formed in the 70s, but since it really hit mainstream, you know, around 94, 95. And I've been lucky in that uh, over the course of my career, I've had what I call uh, fairly major epiphanies, career epiphanies that have always guided my next step in terms of where do I build skills, what, what kind of companies uh, do I go after? So I, I'll, I'd love to walk you guys through just at a at a high level through my career journey and in particular how it was driven by some of those career epiphanies. So to start now, you know, 1986, that's when I was first exposed to a computer, uh, Commodore 64, is a present that my dad got me, and I got sucked into that thing and <laughs> spent many many hours uh, not sleeping and said uh, programming and playing games and my very first epiphany that came out of that was, wow, I really love computers and I probably want to do this uh, forever. And that's, uh, that's, that's held true, which is nice. Uh, the next year, 1987, uh, I actually started to get paid for using computers. Uh, uh, back then, for those of you that are actually that old, <laughs> there was a company called Digital Equipment. It was the top, uh, one of the top provider of mainframe systems. And it was a system called a VAX, which is this huge thing in a huge cabinet. Um, there was a VAX, there was something called a PDP-11, but these were you know, effectively dumb terminals connected to smart machines. And uh, my computer science teacher in high school said, wow, you're really good at this. Do you, you, know, you can go make some money. And I said, great. So I ended up consulting, uh, becoming a consultant and building computer systems for uh, predominantly my school district, which was fascinating. Uh, and that led me to you know, career epiphany number two, which is, yeah, I can make money this way. And it's not only is it fun, but you know, it can be a career. I went to college, University of Pennsylvania, Wharton School of Business. Uh, I actually started out in computer science and switched over to business uh, because I realized that I did want to go run a company someday, uh, which turned out to be true, which is great. Uh, and went to join Microsoft in 1993, right out of school. So it was my first job uh, out of college. And in 95 at Microsoft, that was the center of the tech universe, of course, at the time. Uh, that's when uh, Bill Gates sent out his famous memo uh, right around that time period around you know the impact of the internet, and it just resonated with me. I saw you know, a new, uh, effectively a universal network forming upon which software could be better delivered, could be updated, uh, and it was very clear to me that all software that mattered, or the vast majority of software that mattered in the future, was going to be connected. Uh, and I, I said at that point in time, well, that's where I want to be because I think the world of shrink wrap big software. Yeah, it might persist in some way, shape, or form, but not forever. So uh, yeah, it was pretty cool. At that time, we uh, 
in the marketing organization at Microsoft, they didn't have an online marketer because it didn't really exist as a function. They had you know, the person in charge of direct mail and the person in charge of PR. Uh, and at the time I was in the consumer products division at Microsoft, so the, the unit that uh, focused all on the home and selling uh, CD-ROMs at the time to the home market. And so we constructed, you know, I became the first you know, electronic marketing, online marketing manager for that division at the company that was really at the center of the universe in terms of uh, the evolution, which was uh, which is just a great experience. Uh, I was did a number of different roles at Microsoft, all uh, online focused. Launched some of their first commerce sites. I left it in 1999 uh, to do my own to do uh, one of my first startups, and that's where I had uh, an epiphany around tasks. So uh, the the startup concept that I went to kick off at that point in time was mine. It was called ZapSpot, and it came from a realization that software up until that point in time had been had become way too complex. You know, this is the world of of Office and you know big shrink wrap CD ROMs with so many features. Uh, and what struck me when I saw the power of the internet was, well, that model will change over time, right? You 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 should mod you should start to modularize or have software modularized down to more discrete tasks that can solve very specific problems. And the only reason that hadn't happened up until that point in time in the industry evolution was because you didn't have a distribution channel that could deal with it, right? You couldn't, you know, you couldn't sell a calculator. That was one of the examples I always used when I did my startup. And you, know, you couldn't sell a calculator back then. <laughs> no one's gonna, you know, Office Depot is not gonna put the calculator app, you know, and put it on a CD-ROM and sell it for five ninety nine. But oh, could you download a calculator app onto the desktop over the internet and have some kind of advertising or microtransaction model? Absolutely. So. Uh, very clear to me, the world moves to tasks in 99. I was way, uh, way too early as an aside because I can, it's funny, I can finally describe that business now to people. It was the App Store, but on Windows before the mobile phone. Uh, but all the pieces that were coming into place uh, were, there, were there fairly early. Uh, so uh, we, I did my own startup that hit the dot com uh, kind of implosion in 2000. Uh, in 2002, I went over to a company called iVillage. It was one of the first big social networks at the time. And my fifth career epiphany uh, at that point in time was that many of the more interesting tasks in the world were going to be solved by networks and not by tools. Uh, and I had always been involved loosely in uh, net various networked business models. I was uh, an advisor, an investor to one of the very early uh, Q&A sites. If you guys remember, ask me Dot com. It was one of the kind of like Quora, but in the V1, <laughs> the V1 bubble. Uh, but I've always, I've always been fascinated by these networked business models. And again, it became clear to me that as as more and more people got onto the network, that interesting tasks would be solved by collectives as opposed to individuals. And so I focused a lot of energy, uh, or from that point in time, on you know finding interesting networked businesses uh, that I could go run or learn from, uh, including the one I did right before Evite, which was Kodak Gallery. And then uh, final, not really an epiphany, because I would argue the whole world really saw this one coming to some degree, was in 2008 when, of course, the iPhone right, started to get early traction. And it became clear that these networked solutions to solve tasks were not just going to be um, desktop centric. And in fact, probably the more interesting ones were going to be mobile enabled and enabled by people on the move with geolocation as a core component. So uh, that was kind of sixth, sixth career epiphany. Uh, and all of that really has led me to to formulate some frameworks around, well, how, how does all of that, I mean, why does all that matter in the context of business? Uh, and it's also guided me towards the the jobs that I have. So, yeah, Evite, my current gig, the top digital invitation business today in the world. We send out 20,000 invitations every hour. So over the course of this chat, we'll send close to 20,000. So it's got huge scale. It is a connected consumer business. It is a networked business model. Uh, that helps you solve a task better right? with, with our network and with, with the social graph that gets created. You can find the people you want to send an invitation to and have bi-directional functionality. You know, I invite you, you say yes or no, I tell you what to bring, you say what you're going to bring. Right? All of that can happen in a small, closed social network much more efficiently than without the network. So it's, it's a perfect example of a networked business that solves a particular set of tasks for consumer better than an individual could do on their own. And again, have been uh, at Evite for the last year or so. Uh, so with that as background, I would love to spend some time now uh, deconstructing this concept of a connected business. Uh, and the term uh, which we introduced at the beginning of this conversation, 
the guck, or what I prefer you not to call it, the guck, global ubiquitous connectivity uh, is a new term, which is very simply everyone on the same network all the time, right? When you put it in that frame, it's actually quite simple. It is greater than all of these things. It's greater than the internet. It's greater than wireless. It transcends social, mobile, local. Those are really all manifestations of or components of getting everyone onto the same network all the time but there are they're kind of subcomponent slivers is the way that i actually think about it and in terms of the impact on our day-to-day -day lives you could argue where this actual blue arrow sits but it's it's very far on the low end as opposed to the high end you, know, you, you and i think people get surprised when i make this contention because they say oh my god the world is so different now than it was right think, think pre Pre-internet, pre-connected world, pre-mobile device, and you know, people, it's like, oh, I have this Google and Facebook and information at your fingertips. Uh, I would argue that, yeah, those were all great things, but we are still at the baby stages of understanding or realizing the impact that this can have. And the simple parallel that I draw is having everyone on the same network all the time is equivalent in my mind, if not greater than the impact that electricity had on the society. So here's just a here's a simple deconstruction. If you take, you know, one of the few world changers, and there haven't been a lot of them. If you think about the history of the world, there's electricity, there's you know, communication, um, there is probably one. Uh, you know, they're at that level, and ubiquitous connectivity is in that vein. So if you look here, you have 200 years of power. You know, 1752, you know, early stage. Franklin invents the lightning rod, and you just cruise through and look at the. Um, the steps and the increases in uh, power technology and implications, et cetera. It, you know, it unfolded over 200 years. Now you could argue, well, the society is moving much faster these days and innovation is having it, happening at a more rapid pace. Uh, and I would agree. I think the, the incremental pace of change you're going to see is going to continue to accelerate. Uh, but it doesn't change the fact that uh, we, we, don't even know, we don't know what we don't know in terms of how the world is going to change by having everyone on the same network. And every new business that comes in and disrupts another entire segment unexpectedly is a great testament to that, which is you look at those things, you're like, wow, I would have never thought of that. And that's, you know, that's probably a superior way for this problem to be solved. So literally you know, everything changes with everyone on the same network in my mind, how we interact and share information. Think about Facebook, think about email. That's pretty foundational differences today, how we find information. Think about how easy Google has made it, how we work, how we play. And, Again, this last one, the, the concept of business, which is kind of a radical thought, in my mind, changes. So let, let me describe that in a little bit more depth. And, and first, let me start by you know, brainwashing, hopefully, some of these acronyms out of the world because I, I find them a little imprecise uh, or I use them in different ways. So um, I'm sure many of you have heard the term and probably even used the term you know, B2C. I'm a, you know, I'm a B2C business or I'm a B2B business. You know, what's, a, you know, what's a huge B2C business? Well, Amazon's a huge B2C business. Uh, I, I propose a different, uh, slightly more complex, but uh, more valuable framework, uh, which looks like the following. Uh, it has the concept of to, from, and many. Uh, and I will explain that in a second through a pretty simple diagram. So if you took Take two Bs and stack them on top of each other and two Cs. You know, it's businesses, that's consumer. I call this the BBCC value flow matrix. And you draw some lines uh, back and forth. You can come up with some of the traditional models, right? So in the unconnected world of business, there's your B2C, right? I make something, I'm a business. And you go to the right, you buy something, you're a consumer. Or I make something, you're a business. You go down, you buy something, you're a business. I'm a B2B business. That works in... Um, in an unconnected world, it actually describes a large number of the businesses that exist. But in a connected world, you get all these interesting new value flows that can really change how your business functions, how it creates value. And the thing that's hard to grasp for a lot of people is that it's, it's not push, right? It's not you as a business pushing something to consumer. There's these concepts of pull and bidirectionality, which are really important. So I'm literally going to walk through each one of these in a little bit more depth to make it a little bit more tangible, a little bit less abstract. So let's take the first one, right? The value flow one, B2C. This is a very straightforward one, and this is where I do use the term B2C, although I call it BTC just to try to eliminate confusion. This is a business delivering some value to its consumers. Uh, I frame all of these in a question to make it a little bit easier. So if you're a business, what's a simple question you can ask around this value flow to, to, to be sure you get it? And the question is, 
what product or service can I deliver to consumers that fulfills a core need or want? That's pretty straightforward. What's a good example? Walmart selling products in a store to its consumers as a B2C value flow. So that's uh, pretty straightforward. But what if you invert it? That's where things get kind of interesting. So value flow number two, B from C or BFC. So what's this? This is actually a business extracting value from its consumers through the contribution of its consumers. So what's the question you ask there? What can my consumers or customers provide to me that I can turn into a competitive advantage or more value? It's a fascinating question that is, fine, that is now enabled by the fact that everyone's on the same network. So what are some examples of this? Um, turning, uh, I'll jump to the second bullet, real-time customer feedback that drives your product strategy. Uh, I'll talk about this at the Evite level, but one of, the, my, one of my core tenants is uh, the old model of us ideating on what a product should be is, is a piece of our product engine, but there's an, an equally important piece, which is simply gathering feedback directly from consumers in terms of what they want and turning that into product strategy and product direction. Uh, crowdsourcing content, of course, is another great example of uh, a B from C value flow. Uh, value flow number three, I call it B many C or B X C for shorthand. Right, something that enables, this is a business that is enabling other businesses to connect with consumers. And there your question, uh, as a business, in terms of your business model, can I create unique or sustained value by connecting other businesses with, with consumers? Examples of that, uh, PayPal merchants, Expedia, Facebook pages, a great example of that, right, where Facebook is now becoming an intermediary platform that connects all of the businesses that, that have a page that wants to communicate to all of the consumers that it touches, and they're actually creating value for themselves in the course of that exchange. Very powerful model. Uh, going down now, if you go kind of the B on the B side, kind of the B2B side, uh, it's really a lot of the parallels, but just with the business frame. So there's B2B or B2B, right? Uh, product or service can I deliver to businesses that fulfills a core need or want? So yeah, Boeing selling planes to an airlines is B2B, but B from B, again, very similar to the other, to the B from C, what can my business customers provide to me that I can turn into competitive advantage. Uh, one of my favorite examples here is the mobile application stores that exist for you know, Android and Apple and, and Microsoft's trying to, to break into that model. But if you think about the strategic advantage that is conferred to the platform businesses that are hosting all of those applications, it's massive, right? It's, you know, arguably it's one of the reasons that Apple is the most you know, powerful brand slash highest market cap company on the planet right now. You know, Every single business that puts an application into that ecosystem creates value for Apple and it accretes to the parent company. So it's um, it's a great business stream, value stream, if you can tap into it. Uh, and then of course there's the equivalent, the BXC or B many B, or sorry, B, BXB or B many B, which is can I create unique and sustained value by connecting businesses to each other? Uh, Google's AdWord and AdSense, to the extent that they are businesses advertising to other businesses is a great example of this. You're an intermediary platform where you're taking businesses that need something, connecting it to other businesses and taking a cut, which is awesome. And then the last one uh, is what I call the CXC or C many C. And this is, can I create unique and sustained value by enabling consumers to con connect with other consumers? And this is probably one of my favorite spaces. This is where I, going back to 2002 in that career walkthrough, uh, this is where I have been most excited in my career. And if you look at, it's probably uh, not a surprise when you look at the list of companies that run on a CXC model, right? Facebook, LinkedIn, PayPal, some of the fastest growing companies. You know, Uber, you could argue is a CXC network, right? It's actually connecting consumers with cars with consumers that need rides. They're the intermediary network that makes it all work. Uh, Evite is a CXC business at its core in terms of its invitation business, which I'll talk about. So hopefully that makes sense in terms of those core flows. So, you know, what I'd love to throw out there, at least as a concept, is don't think about you know, B2C, it's really too simple. It's think of that matrix, those different boxes, and think my business is made of these various value flows and which ones are relevant and which ones are not. And you can be very conscious about where you play and where you don't play. And to make that tangible, let's look at Amazon. So again, if anyone tells me that Amazon is a B2C company, I say, no, no, not really. <laughs> we have a long conversation. Uh, if you think of the value flows that Amazon uh, taps into, to give it scale and competitive advantage. There, there are many, and this is just a small handful. So I'll, I'll dabble in just a couple of these. We don't need to go through them all. Uh, but BFC, right? the value flow 
in that kind of middle top box, turning purchasing info from millions of consumers into better recommendations. All right, it's one of their first uh, competitive advantages, you could argue, as a large scale commerce site was the aggregation of the ratings and rankings and the reviews. You know, they didn't do that just to provide, a, you know, they did that, yes, to provide a good customer service. But what did that also give them? A huge competitive asset because no one on the planet has better ratings and reviews for as long a tail of product offerings. And that is a key reason why people go there to look and search for products. Uh, the amount of work that they had to put in to get you know, however many millions or hundreds of millions of reviews that they currently have uh, did not scale linearly with the reviews. Right? It's a, it's a platform that starts to create value, has its own little mini network effects. So you know, a, brilliant, a brilliant model. Um, B from B, so go uh, going straight down the middle, using pricing and purchasing insight from its business partners to optimize its own pricing. You know, think about, uh, I assume all of you have probably purchased on Amazon. Uh, so think about their model now where they are exposing other product offerings in their flow that are sold by other people at other prices, potentially even lower prices. And now think about the amazing value and data asset that they have. They know what products are most popular. They know the pricing elasticity of different product categories. You know, think about the advantage that gives them in terms of their own inventory management. What products should they go buy and source? How should they price, et cetera? And that all comes from you know, what seems like a, a radical competitive idea. Oh, we're going to plug in competitive product offerings from other commerce companies into our flow. When you think of it that way, it sounds radical and crazy. When you think of it in terms of wow, we could plug in commerce companies at different prices into our flow and accrete all of that value to us and figure out how to make that a competitive advantage. It becomes a very different uh, equation, very different optics. Uh, so there, you know, there's just two you know, examples of, of Amazon. You can see some of these others. Hopefully they make, they make a little bit of sense. But the, the core takeaway here is it's not a B2C business. Um, it has a B2C box. If you look at the you know, top left, it sells. It does sell product. It has huge warehouses. It sells directly to consumers. So absolutely, it's a large chunk of its business that is in the B2C model. Uh, but its overall ability to create value and competitive advantage is more complex. So why does this all matter? You know, it's just a lot of boxes. Uh, it matters to me in terms of when I when I run and look at businesses or business opportunities because. If you can really master these different value flows and you make the right strategic choices and the right product choices, you will get more rapid scale. You will get superior economics. You can build better experiences. And more importantly, you can build a, a more resilient business model over time. Because really what you're doing at the core, you're actually building a, an ecosystem as opposed to just a product or a service. Right? If you think, if you think about Amazon and all those different connection points that I just walked through, it is, it is an ecosystem of commerce and buying. It is not you know, just somebody that sells product offerings. So that's been very important to me as I, you know, over the last 10 or 15 years, as I've evolved this framework and my thinking, it's something that I apply to businesses in, real, in a real world setting. So let's segue into Evite and I can spend the last couple of minutes actually walking through kind of a, a mini version of how you would apply that in, in uh, real world terms. So again, uh, Evite, for those of you that, uh, hopefully for the small percentage that are not familiar, uh, online invitation service, our core, core business is digital invitations, which uh, has been around for 16 plus years. That was when Evite was founded. Uh, and at its core, that is a value proposition that is in the CXC quadrant, which I describe, right? These are consumers that are connecting to other consumers that they know to get them together for an event or party. So it's got a great, uh, has a great viral coefficient in its model, right? Consumers acquire other consumers into the system. So that gives it rapid scale. That's why we send out 180 million invitations every year. It also connects businesses. Businesses use the platform, you know, nonprofits getting together for corporate events. So it has a BXE component. It's connecting businesses with consumers. Uh, so that's historically what the business has been, uh, reasonably straightforward. Uh, and its advertising model, its monetization model historically has been uh, a BXC value flow, right? connecting businesses that want to reach those consumers, either hosting or going to those parties with relevant offers and advertising. So, you know, these are not uh, super targeted here, but you can imagine, you know, a common advertiser, people that sell, uh, say, alcohol for a party. It's like, yes, we'd like to get in front of all of the hosts that are about to throw a party or a barbecue over the summer with our new brand and our new offering. So that's 
a BXC value flow. Now I'm going to share some examples of where we're taking the business and adding functions and features uh, across this framework that can give us, again, more scale, more resilience, lower cost, better product experience over time. So party content has been added recently to the Evite experience. Uh, literally, you know, really, uh, it's been a push over the last 18 months, maybe two years, uh, which is a very simple thought, which is, hey, you know, in addition to just going to the party and managing your uh, your invitation details, we should probably give you value-added content so you can actually figure out what to bring or we can, you can make interesting food for the party or event, etc. So we <clears throat> originally had this as a subsite called Gatherings that's now getting integrated into the core experience. It's a lot of content. Uh, it is a B to C value flow to some degree. So we have editors uh, that are actually creating articles, but more importantly, and where we're heading over time is, is the BXC model. So a large chunk of the content that is going to be produced, that is produced, doesn't come from us. It comes from third party experts that we're simply connecting to our user base in a BXC model. And it accretes scale to us, right? It becomes uh, a valuable asset for consumers. They come to us and that becomes a, a self-feeding system. So that's a great example of a product extension or a value proposition extension that is in a BXC flow, if that makes sense. Uh, gifting and registries is another key part of the experience. So this is functionality where if you're throwing uh, a, a wedding or a birthday party, you can quickly add a wedding registry or a birthday wish list. This is one click. These are through providers that provide that functionality. This is not something that we have built. And so you can think of that is that's a BXC, right? We're, we're connecting businesses that have commerce and registry functionality with consumers, with our consumers, and we're the intermediary, and we get a cut of that. Highly scalable, uh, highly scalable model, doesn't require a lot of infrastructure. Uh, again, starts to build an ecosystem around us. Uh, design requests, this is one of my favorites. So one of the, one of the big question marks around a business like Evite, we have thousands and thousands of designs and we put, you know, put out hundreds of new designs uh, on a perpetual basis. Uh, the question is, well, what designs should you put out there? <laughs> because there is a very long tail of designs that people want. And, you know, there's a very simple uh, process that we've put into place uh, that we've experimented with. And at some point we will go um, uh, much more hardcore on, which is simply, well, let's stop trying to guess what designs you want. And let's just have you tell us the designs that you want. So uh, it's not on our site live now, but it will be back up soon. You know, a, literally a link at the bottom of the design template that say, hey, did you not find your... You didn't find what you were looking for? Well, tell us what you want. So ima imagine that simple form now feeding us. This is B from C, right? It's, it's value that our consumers are giving us. They, they are telling us what designs are most important. We'll have the distribution of, oh, well, you know, for some reason, I don't know, you know, ice skating parties in Iowa <laughs> seem to be really hot and interesting. So we should go build those. Uh, that is insight that no one else on the planet can have because they don't have our scale. So it becomes competitive advantage for us, and it also helps us build a better product because it fulfills the consumer need. So great example of a BFC value flow. And then the last example, uh, in the same way that Facebook have pages, we have a concept for partners, which we're in the process of testing and scaling. We did, uh, you know, think of this as evite.com slash your company name. So evite.com slash Taylor Swift, which was one of our first examples of this. Um, it is basically a way for brands or companies to use invitation functionality to reach their customers. So in the Taylor Swift example, when she launched her last album, which is awesome, by the way, I'm not afraid to admit that. <laughs> I've got two young girls. Uh, when she launched her last album, she uh, we created templates. She sent these out to her fan base and said, hey, let's throw listening. Let's let's have you, our fans, throw listening parties when we launch the album using these templates. So, you know, there were you know, thousands of Taylor Swift fans that were creating events where they were inviting their friends, right? It allowed her to amplify her reach and it all happened on our platform. So it's a great, it has multiple dimensions of this, right? It was connect, it connects business with other consumers. It creates value for us in terms of now there's more activity, more relevant designs, uh, et cetera. So, you know, in a summary, if, if, if I think about the Evite business and the value flows, we are moving the business out of what was a single box quadrant into a much more blended world of multiple value flows and into a much more uh, much more of an ecosystem as opposed to just a single point offering.
So hopefully that that makes some sense in terms of how you actually apply that in a real real world setting. Victor, I'm reminded of a session I was in at Impact 14 where one of the leaders of a company called Zephyr, which is an online video digital rights management company, was touching on some of the things that that you mentioned here today, but certainly not in this level of detail. And at the end of it, he was saying, so guys, it really comes down to the fact that it isn't B to C, it isn't B to B anymore. It's just H to H. How long has this been percolating within you? How long have you been documenting this? When was this back of napkin? And how many iterations has it gone through before it's gotten to this stage, which I think is pretty refined? Oh, you know, it's a great question. Uh, so it had been it's been percolating for a while. I think my first broad sharing and codification of this happened while I was at Intuit, a couple of years in. So that was let's see, 2006. Uh, and then I'd say you know the core components and tenants were back of the napkin for a good you know four years before that. Ever since I village, I'd say Cause that's when the network that's when the concept of network businesses really really started to get me excited. So yeah, call it. Uh, what is that? What, what year is this? <laughs> 14, 13 years? <laughs> 13 years in the making, potentially. So knowing that that's been within you, how did that knowledge, because I think you were ahead of the curve, re- recognizing how much was changing as a result of the internet, how did that knowledge tweak the roles that you played at, at prior organizations? Ophoto, um, even Evite, you coming in with this, look guys, it's not about B to B or B to C, what were you able to implement or what kind of a, a, a takeaway were you able to give your staff that maximized or that gave them some of this insight and that they were able to actually take away and put into practice? Uh, so let me answer maybe the first part of the question. Uh, for me, this is a, it's kind of, and it's so ingrained now in how I think it's kind of a, a de facto filter when new job opportunities come across the floor, when I'm even thinking about new businesses, this is just kind of implied in how I think about it. So uh, a point example, when uh, I was at Intuit and got a call for a photo, Kodak Gallery, you know, literally I go through this framework in my head, which is, okay, what's the current business model? Like wh- what are untapped opportunities for this business in terms of value creation, either, you know, from consumers, connecting consumers, uh, and you know something like an Ophoto, which is a photo sharing site, at its core is a CXC business, and so that's always a, a plus for me. Which is okay, great. <laughs> do you have an underlying core platform that's actually a fairly resilient model or a CXC model, which I which I tend to love? And Evite's the same way. I right? looked at Evite and said, at your core, you've got a CXC business. It can be so much more if you extend it out into these other areas, and and it ha- you know it hasn't been doing that historically. So. It definitely becomes a filter uh, for me as I assess opportunities, businesses. I, I do advise I, I advise companies and sit on a board of a uh, a startup. So it's it's, it's always a component uh, of my feedback. In terms of my team, uh, you know that's a good question. I I would just hope I don't know. It'd be funny for me to go and survey them. I, I would hope that as a leave behind, I leave them with a more sophisticated frame for how they think about the world. And that's, it was one of the reasons I put all this online. So this entire presentation and and full of detail is actually online in a deck. I did that in, uh, I want to say in 2012, maybe so three years ago. Uh, But yeah, no, I just, I I just love to share the thinking and uh, hopefully some of it will stick. And more importantly, I hope I get feedback from other people uh, to refine and, and modify and evolve it over time. Well, there's a key takeaway for me in, in what you just said, which is you can, when faced with a new opportunity or a new business, you can look at which of the components of the framework currently exist. And this is how you describe what you did at Evite. So, mm-hmm. okay, you have a, a CXC and that the business is sitting in the middle of that, creating a market essentially. But where else? What other models could we leverage? Yeah. in order to drive significant value because that work is already being done. It's just not being monetized. It's not being coddled. It's not being incubated. And so there's there's a way to, to monetize or drive revenue from those things that somebody who's not looking at it with this framework either wouldn't recognize or wouldn't recognize as easily as if they were using your framework. Yeah, yeah that, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. There's a whole... Uh, it's funny, I have a whole separate deck, which is uh, uh, this still back of the napkin, uh, hasn't been put yet on paper, but it's it's the evolution of the role of marketing in a connected world. So it's kind of taking this frame and now saying, okay, if this is the world we're operating in, how does marketing actually change? And one of my contentions is, you know, is marketing is way behind because we use that, you know, we use four Ps and stuff. It's actually fairly archaic. But w- one of the components of that frame is there's the concept of an ecosystem builder 
that is an important role in a business, which is someone who can do exactly what you're describing, who can actually look at the value flows of the business and figure out where, you know, where are the right leverage points to create value. And it's, it's a mix of product and marketing because a lot of the, a lot of the tweaks you make to the business are experiential tweaks, kind of product tweaks. And that's where the role of marketing and product and product really is blending. It's, it's creating interesting friction in my mind. Well, and to that point, I want to talk specifically about the party content. I know we're, we're pressed for time here, so I'll be quick. But as you develop the content engine behind Evite, which is more the B2C or BXC model, you talked about having some editors that, that provide that content, that create that content. I'm sure there's user-generated content that could also be uh, leveraged here. I think you mentioned some of that. Have you thought about diffusing that editor role so that, you know, almost like that Uber model, almost like pushing the business down directly to the consumer, you have more of your consumers aggregating, providing, or editing that content. Oh, no, no, it, exactly. So uh, we have one editor right now and literally hundreds of articles, the vast majority of content that has been put up onto the site uh, is has, has some component of sourcing uh, from either consumers or or other party experts. And no, we haven't actually opened up the funnel on consumer direct consumer content, but that's the, that's exactly the kinds of questions that I want my team at asking themselves, right? Well, what what would happen, right? <laughs> if we actually took all the millions of people that were throwing parties and we gave them an ability to, right, upload the pictures of the cool decorations that they put up and put in tips and have a platform for them to talk about it, you know, how you know, would people be interested? Would the quality be good enough? But if if the answer is yes and yes to some of those things, then you have an awesome content creation engine that would be very low cost. So now that exact thought is spot on. It's exactly how you you know, can use the framework to find those nuggets of high scale, high leverage, low cost. I think once you understand the framework, which again, I think some folks are going to have to go back and, and either listen twice or go through it again or download the, the deck, which you mentioned a location. We'll also link a copy of the deck uh, to the show notes page for our episode uh, here, and, and people can find that at imanetwork.org slash webinar. But once you understand that, it really does, you see the world differently. And I think this is what you've been describing, and I'm sort of drinking the Kool-Aid as I'm listening to you talk about this, because you you see opportunity where other people don't. Yeah, Exactly. Well, Victor, in closing, let me ask you to share how people can engage you on this topic or ask you some questions if they're interested in learning some more. Absolutely. So uh, yeah, email, easy to reach me, victor.cho at evite.com. I tend to be pretty good about getting back to folks. So uh, always reachable. I always love making the connection. I find every every interaction can create value in some way, shape, or form, even in unexpected ways. And yeah, for those of you that are interested in this kinds of content or uh, or uh, kind of a deeper dive in the concept of connected networks, etc. You can find all of that. On, I've got a website where all that's publicly available at victorcho.info, uh, including uh, there's a whole separate section there also on uh, task-based networks. Because I've, I've mentioned this concept of networks solving tasks. Uh, there's a whole another deep deck there around that concept as well, which is uh, one of my passion areas. Well, I can tell there's a lot of thought in everything you do, especially here. So I know I'll be checking out the uh, the resources you just mentioned. And then I'll have the opportunity because I will be in Las Vegas this September at Impact 15 at the beautiful Aria Resort um, to hear you speak from the stage. And I'm looking forward to shaking your hand, meeting you face to face and, and thanking you for the, the insight and also the time that you spent with us today and in our previous episode. Excellent. Now, Dominic, uh, ditto. Really looking forward to meeting in person and, and looking forward to the event. It's going to be a great one. And I couldn't agree more. IMA members, if you haven't registered yet for Impact 15, you can do that at impact15.org. Uh, the event does sell out, so I encourage you to register early. Uh, Victor was announced recently as a main stage speaker. There, He will be joined by dozens of others, and there will be dozens of small breakout sessions where you can interact with people like Victor and other leaders in the industry. So again, if you haven't registered for Impact 15, please do so now at impact15.org. Upcoming episodes from leaders across our industry, from organizations like Google, Microsoft, Adobe, and more. There's a lot to be excited about this summer, so stay tuned, IMA. Ready to join the Internet Marketing Association? Membership is free at imanetwork.org slash podcast. It takes less than one minute to gain access to research, education, and opportunities to move your career forward. Already a member? We'd love to hear your story. 
Introduce yourself at podcast at imanetwork.org for a chance to be featured on the show. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time on I Am A Leader.